Section 83 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Earl of Ellingham and Lady Hatfield again. It was about two o'clock on the day following the incidents just related that we shall find the Earl of Ellingham seated with Lady Georgiana Hatfield in the drawing-room at the residence of the latter. Arthur had returned on the preceding evening from France, accompanied by Mr. de Medina and Esther, after having seen Tom Rain, Tamar, and Jacob Smith embark at Havre de Grasse for the United States. Rainford and Tamar were united in the bonds of matrimony in Paris, and Mr. de Medina had insisted upon placing in the hands of his son-in-law a sum of ten thousand pounds, as a proof of his perfectly cordial feeling towards him, and of his determination also fully to recognise Tamar as his daughter again. The Earl communicated all these incidents to Lady Hatfield, who listened to them with the greatest interest. "'I propose to introduce the Medinas to you shortly, Georgiana,' said the young nobleman. "'You will find the father a person of very gentlemanly manners, well read, and particularly agreeable in conversation, while his daughter, Miss Esther, is as amiable and accomplished as the child of such a man should be.' "'Arthur,' replied Lady Hatfield, for they now addressed each other in the same friendly, or rather familiar, manner when alone together, as if they were brother and sister. I would rather not form the acquaintance of your friends for the present. The Earl appeared surprised and vexed. Georgiana, he exclaimed, in a tone of gentle remonstrance, is it possible that you entertain any of those ridiculous prejudices which only very ignorant or very narrow-minded persons can possibly entertain towards a most estimable race? "'Oh, no, no!' cried Lady Hatfield emphatically. "'I have read much concerning the Jews, "'and I feel convinced that they are most unjustly treated by Christians. "'Heaven knows, Arthur, that I have no bad prejudices of that nature, "'and were I imbued with them, "'I would never rest till I had stifled such evidences "'of an illiberal and narrowed mind.' "'I am delighted to hear you thus express yourself,' said the Earl. During my sojourn in France with the Medina family, I have obtained a great insight into the Jewish character, and I am convinced that it is fully as benevolent, as generous, and as liberal as that of the Christian. But we were speaking of my proposed presentation of Mr. Medina and his daughter Esther to you. From all that I have said to them concerning you, they are most anxious to form your acquaintance, and you have yet to explain to me the meaning of your observation that you would rather postpone the introduction. "'To justify myself,' returned Georgiana, blushing, "'against your suspicion that I entertain illiberal prejudices, Arthur, I will frankly state my motives for expressing that wish. Indeed, I know not why any consideration should induce me to retain those motives a secret, especially as the explanation of them will afford me an opportunity to give you my advice.' For have we not agreed to be unto each other as brother and sister? And in what can a sister more conscientiously advise her brother than in matters regarding his happiness? My happiness? exclaimed the Earl, starting slightly, and evincing some degree of astonishment at Lady Hatfield's remark. Yes, Arthur, your happiness, repeated Georgiana, with difficulty suppressing a sigh. Now listen to me attentively. I have heard that Miss Esther de Medina is eminently beautiful, excessively accomplished, very amiable, and endowed with every qualification to render her worthy of becoming even a monarch's bride. Georgiana, cried the Earl of Ellingham, his heart fluttering with mingled suspense, surprise, and joy. Yes, observed Lady Hatfield, and since you have learnt, she added more slowly, and in a softly plaintive tone, though she endeavoured to subdue the emotion which so modulated her voice, 
since you have learnt that our union is impossible, Arthur, since you have ceased to look upon me otherwise than as a sister, it is probable, nay, it is both natural and certain, that you cannot have beheld Esther de Medina with indifference. Georgiana, exclaimed Arthur in a solemn tone, I never can forget that my first love was devoted to you, and although circumstances have, alas, prevented our union, yet I should be unwilling to promise to another that heart which I so freely, so gladly gave to you. It is alike unjust and ridiculous for me to suppose that as I cannot become your wife, Arthur, you may never marry. No, continued Lady Hatfield, I should despise myself were I to entertain such abhorrent selfishness. My ardent desire is to know that you are happy, and Esther de Medina is well qualified to ensure your felicity. Nay, interrupt me not. Remember, it is now a sister who counsels a brother. Granting even that you could never love another as you have loved me, and this is a supposition which I have not vanity enough to entertain for a moment, but even granting it for argument's sake, you may yet treat a beautiful and affectionate wife with that tenderness, those delicate attentions, and that cherishing kindness, which will make her happy. Oh, believe me, such a state of bliss would soon beget love in your heart, a love for Esther as ardent and sincere as that with which you honoured me. For it is the mere idle theory of romance writers that the same heart cannot love twice. Nature herself proclaims the falsehood of the doctrine, and the experience of all wise legislators, whether secular or ecclesiastic, declares the same by the mere fact of allowing second marriages. Believe me, Arthur, I am speaking solely in regard to your happiness, and the day shall come when your lips breathe the words, Georgiana, I thank thee for the counsel thou gavest me. The earl surveyed with respectful admiration that noble-hearted woman, who thus stifled her own feelings through generous solicitude for his felicity. And now, she resumed, after a moment's pause, you can divine the reasons which induced me to express a wish that my introduction to the Medinas should be postponed for the present. I am but a weak woman, and though I can proudly say that no petty feeling of jealousy would ever enter my heart, yet I would rather not awaken in my mind painful recollections of what might have been, by beholding you in the society of one to whom you would be engaged. Moreover, as Miss Medina has doubtless heard that our union was once resolved upon, added Lady Hatfield, now unable to suppress a profound sigh, it would not be agreeable for her to visit me, if she accepts you as her husband, until after your marriage. Those are my motives, Arthur, and now you will admit that so far from entertaining any illiberal prejudices against the Jews, I have proved the very contrary by earnestly recommending you to espouse an amiable and beautiful lady belonging to that nation. Dearest sister, for such indeed you are to me, said the Earl of Ellingham, I appreciate all the excellence of your intentions in thus advising me, and I will frankly admit to you that did I now think of uniting my fate with any woman, Esther de Medina would be the object of my choice, since my alliance with yourself has been rendered impossible. But I am not quite prepared to take that step, nor do I even know whether Miss de Medina would accept my suit were I to offer it. If her affections were not engaged before she saw you, before she knew so much of you, exclaimed Georgiana, she loves you now. Oh, of this I am convinced, she continued enthusiastically. Consider how much you have done to render her grateful to you, and gratitude in women is the parent of affection. You have saved her beloved sister Tamar from the depths of despair by adopting those wonderful schemes by which he who is now her husband was snatched from the jaws of death. You reconciled a father to a long-discarded daughter, and you have at length seen that daughter made a wife, the wife of the man she adores. 
oh arthur think you not that esther ponders on all this yes and in the gratitude of her generous soul she already sees a godlike being in the earl of ellingham you will render me quite vain georgiana said the young nobleman for you are magnifying into glorious achievements a few very commonplace acts on my part i am giving you your due for all that is great and noble in your disposition all that is excellent and estimable in your character replied lady hatfield in a tone of fervent sincerity and that you are everything i describe is so much the more to your credit inasmuch as you belong to a class not famous for good qualities the aristocratic sphere is characterized by intense selfishness by a love of illegitimate power by an abhorrence of the inferior grades and by a hollowness of heart which brings shame and reproach upon their hierarchy when then we find this corrupted and vicious sphere possessing a glorious exception such as yourself the world should be the more ready to recognise your merits but i will say no more on this head my dear arthur added georgiana with a smile for fear that you should think i wish to coax you into following that counsel which i ere now so seriously and so conscientiously gave you and on that advice will i reflect deliberately replied the earl who could not conceal from himself that he was rejoiced it had been given and now georgiana i must take my leave of you for the present he added rising from his seat for i have a commission of a somewhat important nature to execute for my half-brother indeed the mention thereof reminds me that i have never made you acquainted with one of the best traits of his character but does it annoy you does it vex you to hear me speak of him no no answered georgiana somewhat hurriedly since i have known that he is your brother i have been pleased to hear you say as much good of him as possible and this incident to which i allude continued the earl is not the least praiseworthy of the many fine deeds which must be placed to his account on the bright side it appears that about three months ago he adopted a little boy under very peculiar circumstances a poor woman died suddenly through want and exposure to the inclemency of the weather at an obscure house in seven dials rainford happened to be there at the time and he took compassion on the little boy whom this poor woman had in charge the boy was not the woman's child as a certain letter found upon the person of the female proved this letter was at first detained by those miserable wretches who so persecuted my poor brother but it subsequently fell into his hands and he entrusted it to a mr clarence villiers in order that this gentleman might institute inquiries relative to its contents i am now about to seek mr villiers to obtain the letter from him because it appears from all i have heard that it is indubitably addressed to some lady of title although no name be mentioned in it in fact the poor woman whose name was sarah watts sarah watts repeated lady hatfield with a hysterical scream a deadly pallor overspreading her beautiful countenance that is the name but my god you are ill and the earl rushed forward to catch georgiana in his arms as she was falling from her chair he conveyed her to the sofa but for some moments she seemed insensible he was about to summon her female attendants when she opened her eyes glanced wildly around her and then said in an excited tone do not ring for any one i shall be better in a minute remain with me arthur i have now much to tell you surprised and grieved at the effect which his words had produced on lady hatfield yet unable to comprehend wherefore the mere mention of a name should have so seriously touched her feelings the earl gazed upon her with interest and curiosity at length a faint tinge of red appeared upon her cheeks and with reviving strength she sat up on the sofa motioning the young nobleman to take a chair near her arthur she said i ought not to have kept that one secret from you for are we not now brother and sister but alas you with your generous heart and fine feelings can well understand how painful it is for me to speak of my own dishonour and the more so since that degradation that deep disgrace 
was caused by him who is nearly allied to you. What? Can it be possible? exclaimed the earl, a sudden light breaking in upon him. That child, that boy whom Rainford has adopted as his own, is mine, said Georgiana, in a voice of despair, and covering her face with her hands, she burst into an agony of tears. The Earl of Ellingham started from his seat, and began to pace the room in a manner denoting the most painful excitement. He was indeed deeply afflicted. How wronged, how profoundly wronged had Georgiana been, and by him who, as she herself had said, was so nearly allied to him. Oh, Tom Rain, Tom Rain, that was the darkest episode in thy life. Thus thought the Earl likewise, and bitter was his sorrow at the revival of such appalling reminiscences as those which now rent Lady Hatfield's heart with anguish, and called forth the floods of grief from her eyes. Arthur, at length she said, exercising a violent effort to subdue her sorrow, give not way to bitter reflection on my account. For your sake all has been forgiven, though it may never be forgotten for memory is immortal. But that child, that boy of whom you speak, he is indeed with his own father, and Providence doubtless willed that it should be so. She paused, and stifled the sobs which rent her bosom. You may think me a cruel and heartless mother, Arthur, she resumed at length, now speaking in a mournful, plaintive tone, thus to have abandoned my offspring. But reflect, ere you blame me, I was, as it were, alone in a house situated in a retired part of the country. A man entered at night. He found his way to my chamber. He took advantage of my loneliness. Oh, God, how have I survived that disgrace, that infamy? Desperate was my resistance, but vain. And the ravisher, as you already know, was Rainford. Alas, pardon me if I then mentioned his name with bitterness but human patience could not speak it calmly when such a cloud of crushing reminiscences come back to the soul. Again she paused. The earl remained silent. What could he say? He loathed, he abhorred the conduct of his half-brother, whom he would not attempt to justify, and his good sense told him that it were worse than mockery to aim at consoling the victim of that foul night of maddened lust and atrocious rape. Some weeks afterwards, continued Lady Hatfield, in a voice scarcely audible and deeply plaintive, I found that I was in a way to become a mother. You may conceive, but no, it is impossible to imagine the state of mind into which this appalling conviction threw me, and yet I was compelled to veil my grief as much as possible, for at that time a suspicion of my condition on the part of the world would have driven me to suicide. I need not, I could not, enter into the details of the plan which I adopted to conceal my dishonour. Suffice it to say that I succeeded in so doing, and, in a small retired village, and under a feigned name, did I give birth to a son. To Sarah Watts was the babe confided, and for a sum of money paid down at once, she agreed to adopt it as her own. By an accident she discovered who I was, my name was on an article of jewellery which I had with me, but she promised the strictest secrecy, and I put faith in her words. Oh, do not blame me if I acted as I have now described, if I abandoned that child whose presence near me would only have been a proof of my dishonour, and a constant memorial of the dread outrage which no levity, no encouragement, no fault on my part had provoked. Blame you, Georgiana? exclaimed the earl, approaching and taking her hand kindly. How could I blame you? You acted as prudence dictated, and indeed as circumstances inevitably compelled you. But, now that the parentage of this child is at length discovered, how do you wish me to act? Remember, Georgiana, everything in this respect shall be managed solely with regard to your wishes, solely according to your directions. Shall I communicate in a letter to my half-brother the secret which has thus strangely transpired this day? Or shall I leave him in ignorance of the fact that he has adopted his own son? 
he knew not that the outrage he perpetrated led to that consequence said lady hatfield now cruelly bewildered and uncertain how to decide no he could not even suspect it for i never met him again until that night on the hounslow road and even then i recognised him not and it was only at the police office in bow street that i again beheld him who had been my ruin i am convinced observed the earl that rainford has not the least suspicion that you indeed became a mother and oh when i touched upon the subject of his atrocious behaviour towards you while we were in paris had you seen the tears of contrition heartfelt contrition which he shed but no added the earl suddenly interrupting himself it were impossible that you could forgive him i forgive him for your sake arthur said georgiana in a mild but firm tone and now relative to that child yes he shall know that he is with his father and your brother must be informed that he has adopted his own son providence indeed seems to have so willed it for we cannot believe that accident alone threw the child thus wondrously into the way of the author of its being arthur she added taking the young nobleman's hand you will write to rainford and you will tell him all it is not necessary to enjoin him to treat the child with kindness for you say that his disposition is naturally generous nevertheless i should wish continued the lady looking down as she uttered these words and sinking her voice almost to a whisper for maternal feelings were stirring within her bosom nevertheless i should wish that you impress upon the mind of your half-brother the necessity of bringing that child up in the paths of virtue and honour your wishes shall be complied with answered the earl but fear not that rainford would inculcate evil principles into the mind of his son no he is thoroughly changed and will become a good and i hope a happy and prosperous man the young nobleman then took leave of lady hatfield whom he left a prey to emotions of a very painful nature for deeply and tenderly did she love arthur and great violence did she to her feelings when she so generously and conscientiously counselled him to take the beautiful jewess as his wife and as the earl returned home to his mansion in pall mall to pen a letter to rainford who was then on his voyage under an assumed name and accompanied by tamar jacob smith and little charlie to the united states he reviewed all the details of that long and interesting conversation which had that afternoon passed between lady hatfield and himself and he found that the tendency thereof was to make him ponder more seriously and more intently upon the image of the charming esther than he ever yet had done end of section eighty three Section 84 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Mrs. Slingsby and Mr. Torrens. While the scene related in the preceding chapter was taking place at the residence of lady hatfield in piccadilly incidents requiring mention occurred elsewhere mrs slingsby was seated in her drawing-room a prey to the most frightful alarms sir henry courtenay had left her the evening before to acquaint mr torrens with rosamond's flight and consult with him relative to the necessary steps to be taken to prevent the exposure which himself and mrs slingsby so much dreaded on thus parting with her the baronet had faithfully promised to call early in the morning and inform her of the particulars of his interview with mr torrens but it was now past one o'clock in the afternoon and he had not made his appearance what could his absence mean had anything disagreeable occurred was it possible that rosamond could have made away with herself and that sir henry had taken to flight through dread of an exposure and its consequences the suspense which mrs slingsby endured was horrible horrible 
guilty consciences invariably magnify into giants even the most dwarf-like causes of apprehension and there was no exception to this rule on the present occasion a hundred times had she glanced at the elegant ormolu clock on the mantel and as hour after hour passed and he came not her restlessness increased to such a degree that it at length reached a state of nervous excitement no longer endurable she accordingly hurried to her chamber dressed herself in her walking attire and having left word with her servants that in case sir henry courtenay should call he was to be requested to wait until her return sped to the nearest hackney coach stand where stepping into a vehicle she ordered the driver to take her over to torrens cottage yes thither she was determined to proceed without delay even at the risk of encountering rosamond though she could scarcely believe that the wronged girl had returned home for not precisely remembering all the details of the conversation which took place between herself and the baronet and which rosamond had overheard the guilty woman imagined that something more than mere allusions might have been made to the connivance of mr torrens in the ruin of his daughter and hence mrs slingsby's very natural supposition that the victim of the infernal plot had not returned to the parental dwelling the coach did not proceed with particular celerity and the distance from the west end to torrens cottage was great mrs slingsby had therefore ample leisure to continue her harrowing meditations upon the real or supposed dangers which menaced her in sooth her position was by no means an enviable one unless indeed a convict under sentence of death might have preferred her state to that of imminent and ignominious death for circumstances appeared suddenly to combine against her she was in the family way and this was alone sufficient to cause her the most serious chagrin especially as her impious scheme of proclaiming herself a second johanna southcott had been so completely frustrated by the determined opposition of her paramour then there was the affair of rosamond torrens one word from whose lips would have the effect of tearing away the mask of hypocrisy which mrs slingsby had so long worn and exposing her to the world in all the hideous nudity of her criminal character lastly the unaccountable absence of the baronet filled her mind with the most serious misgivings for she knew that if he had indeed absconded that if he should cease to maintain her in a pecuniary sense her position would become lamentable in the extreme all these maddening reflections raised a storm of agitation in her guilty mind and she could scarcely subdue her excitement so that it should escape the notice of the coachman as he opened the door of the vehicle when it stopped opposite torrens cottage mr torrens was at home and mrs slingsby was immediately conducted by jeffreys to the parlour the very parlour where her paramour had been murdered on the preceding evening rosamond from her bedroom window had observed the arrival of the hateful woman and was lost in surprise at her conduct in daring to visit her father's abode mr torrens received mrs slingsby in the apartment where as we have just stated the awful tragedy of the previous night had been enacted and this was the first time the criminal pair had ever met bad as mr torrens himself was he could not help feeling a sentiment of extreme loathing and disgust for the woman who concealed so black a heart beneath the garb of religious hypocrisy and though he endeavoured to speak politely to her as he desired her to be seated his manner was cold reserved and indicative of the influence which her presence produced upon him we know each other by name mr torrens began mrs slingsby but it is only now that we have met you can doubtless conjecture the object of my visit yes madam exclaimed rosamond suddenly bursting into the room evidently in a state of fearful excitement then hastily closing the door she added my father can too well divine the purport of this insolent intrusion you doubtless seek to recover possession of me to take me back to your infamous abode to surrender me up to your own vile paramour oh my dear father surely surely you will not allow this polluted creature to remain beneath your roof a minute longer rosamond rosamond said mrs slingsby becoming the colour of scarlet 
you will regret those harsh words i came for the purpose of giving certain explanations to your respected parent explanations madam cried the young girl with a bitter smile of contempt what explanations can you offer which i have not already given i have every reason to believe that you overheard a conversation between sir henry courtenay and myself said mrs slingsby growing bolder as she perceived that the atrocious complicity of mr torrens was not suspected by his daughter and that conversation seems to have alarmed you for your flight from the house was wild and precipitate had i not already tarried there too long demanded rosamond emphatically oh think not to be able to delude me any more with your specious misrepresentations your disgusting sophistry a veil has fallen from my eyes and i now behold you madam and that baronet whom you so much vaunted in your proper colours you are wrong thus to suspect us so cruelly said mrs slingsby the conversation which you overheard was but the repetition of another conversation which sir henry courtenay had himself overheard between two persons whom you know not and which he was relating to me but i appeal to your father whether he believes me enough madam exclaimed rosamond in a tone which convinced the base woman that she was indeed no longer to be imposed upon my father knows you to be a degraded hypocrite and your insolence is extreme in thus daring to violate the sanctity of the paternal dwelling to which i have been forced to return for shelter and refuge and were it not she added bitterly that i should be proclaiming my own dishonour not a moment's hesitation would i manifest in tearing away the mask from your face and exposing you to the world oh when i think of all the insidious wiles which you have practised all the abhorrent tutoring which you have brought to play upon my mind i deplore yes deeply do i deplore that necessity which compels me to place a seal upon my lips mrs slingsby had heard enough to satisfy her that no exposure would take place at the hands of rosamond and she was not very solicitous to prolong her visit the cause of the baronet's absence she had yet to learn but she concluded it was not at torrens cottage she must seek to have her curiosity in that respect gratified she accordingly rose bowed to mr torrens who had remained a mute but almost alarmed spectator of the whole scene and hastily withdrew just in time to avoid coming in collision with john jeffreys for that worthy judging by the excited manner in which he himself unobserved had seen rosamond rush into the parlour that something extraordinary was connected with the arrival of mrs slingsby had very coolly and quietly listened at the parlour door to every word that was uttered within mrs slingsby returned home somewhat consoled by the conviction that her character was safe from any vindictiveness on the part of rosamond but she was still alarmed in respect to the baronet and this fear increased greatly when on her arrival in old burlington street at about four o'clock she learned that he had not called she immediately dispatched a note to his residence but the domestic returned with the answer that sir henry courtenay had not been home since the preceding day a circumstance which caused no small degree of alarm in the baronet's household inasmuch as though he often slept away from his abode his servants were invariably kept ignorant of those proofs of irregularities on his part in a word he was accustomed so to arrange matters that his nocturnal outgoings were never suspected at his own residence and thus his absence on this occasion had naturally inspired some degree of apprehension mrs slingsby was astounded at the message which her servant had brought back she could not even hazard a conjecture relative to the cause of sir henry courtenay's disappearance and she was at a loss where to search for him she therefore resolved to remain at home in the hope that he would presently call upon her but time passed and still he came not at length there was a loud double knock at the door and she fancied it was the announcement of sir henry's arrival but instead of the object of her anxiety mr torrens was ushered into the drawing-room i fancied madam he said that you had some particular reason in calling upon me just now 
and which the present of the unfortunate rosamond prevented you from explaining i therefore lost no time in waiting upon you my alarm was somewhat appeased by the words which fell from your daughter's lips answered mrs slingsby motioning her visitor to be seated inasmuch as she expressed her intention of remaining silent on a subject which neither i nor you would wish to become a matter of public gossip but i am astonished and grieved at the behaviour of sir henry courtenay who left me last night with the intention of proceeding direct to your house and whom i have not since seen he came not to me madam answered mr torrens with an unblushing countenance this is most extraordinary most alarming cried mrs slingsby for he has not been home all night nor yet to-day and i begin to have vague suspicions that something wrong must have happened sir henry courtenay is a gallant man yes interrupted mrs slingsby hastily as if the subject were not a very agreeable one but he also maintains a character for propriety and good conduct and his dependents are never suffered to know that he stays away from home at night you see that i am compelled to be candid with you for the affair is most serious now only reflect for a moment mr torrens upon what my state of mind would be were i questioned relative to sir henry's disappearance suppose i say that he did not soon come back that he continued to be missing it would transpire that he was with me until late evening that we went out together for we did go out to search for rosamond and that i came back alone no one could suspect you madam of having made away with him observed mr torrens no but i should be overwhelmed with the most embarrassing questions exclaimed mrs slingsby hastily and do you know that remark of yours has inspired me with horror and alarm no one would suspect me of having made away with him of course not how could a weak woman assassinate a man in the streets of london and not leave a trace of the dreadful deed behind but might not inquiries be made might it not be discovered that sir henry and myself were frequent visitors i must speak candidly to you to a house of ill fame and then oh then what a dreadful exposure would take place you are torturing yourself with vain apprehensions mrs slingsby said mr torrens experiencing the greatest difficulty to conceal his own agitation i should have thought that you mr torrens would have assisted me with your advice considering how we have been involved in the same transaction rather than treat my fears with levity said mrs slingsby in an excited manner and if i tell you the candid truth she added fixing her eyes upon his countenance in a way which seemed intended to read the inmost secrets of his soul i must declare my conviction that you know more about the cause of the baronet's disappearance than you choose to admit i madam exclaimed mr torrens shrinking from the accusation in spite of himself yes you returned the lady growing more and more excited and that suspicion which i hazarded i scarcely know why is now confirmed by your manner i again say yes you know more of the cause of sir henry courtenay's disappearance than you are willing to admit i am convinced that he did visit you last night and if he never came back what account will you give what explanation will you render your anxiety in coming after me just now the singularity of your remark that no one would suspect me of foul play towards a baronet and your trepidation when i named the suspicion which had flashed to my mind concerning you all these circumstances convince me that you are no stranger to the cause of sir henry courtenay's disappearance madam this outrageous charge implying a crime of which i am utterly incapable began mr torrens scarcely knowing how to meet the accusation and seriously inclined to divulge the whole truth i do not say that you have murdered sir henry courtenay interrupted mrs slingsby speaking in a low tone and giving a strong hollow emphasis to that dreadful word which few can breathe without a shudder but that some quarrel may have taken place between you that you were compelled to appear violent and vindictive in respect to him your daughter perhaps being present 
and that all this led to a fatal issue are things which now seem to forge a complete and connected train of horrible impressions in my mind at all events mr torrens she added sinking her voice to a low whisper be candid with me tell me the whole truth and we will consult together circumstances having already rendered us colleagues in one transaction i have nothing to tell you mrs slingsby in respect to this business said mr torrens and i am as astonished at sir henry courtenay's disappearance as yourself then if i were questioned observed the lady you would have no objection to my saying that i parted last night from sir henry courtenay near st james's church piccadilly his last words being to the effect that he was about to call at torrens cottage on particular business as she thus spoke mrs slingsby fixed her eyes in a searching nay a piercing manner upon the countenance of her companion who for a moment quailed and betrayed evident signs of the desperate efforts he was making to conceal his agitation yes you may safely say that if you perceive any utility in so doing returned mr torrens at length then his features suddenly assuming a ferocious expression he added but why proclaim war against me do we not know too much of each other to render such a warfare safe or useful to either were you not the paramour of sir henry courtenay did you yourself not admit ere now that you visited a house of ill fame with him are you not at this moment with child by him woman woman muttered torrens between his teeth provoke me not or it shall be war indeed war to the knife be reasonable sir said mrs slingsby now assuming a cold and resolute air and let us talk as two accomplices ought to converse and not with menaces and threats agreed madam but be you reasonable also returned mr torrens then wherefore keep anything secret from me demanded mrs slingsby i have read the truth i have divined it and your language has just confirmed my impression but think not that i care for sir henry courtenay as a loving mistress or wife might care for him no she added contemptuously any affection which i may ever have experienced towards him has long since vanished and of what avail would it be to you to know that sir henry courtenay was no more even for a moment granting that he indeed exists no longer asked torrens i will tell you replied mrs slingsby in a low and hoarse whisper while she looked intently and in a manner full of dark meaning into her companion's eyes as she bent her countenance towards him if i were assured that sir henry courtenay was indeed no more i would become possessed of two thousand pounds by ten o'clock to-morrow morning ah ejaculated mr torrens his mind instantly conceiving the idea of sharing the produce of whatever plan the lady might adopt to accomplish her purpose for we have already said that his necessities were still great and that unless he shortly obtained funds he would be as badly off as he was ere he sold the virtue of his daughter yes resumed mrs slingsby and to show you that i have more confidence in you than you have in me i will give you a full and complete explanation sir henry courtenay promised me two thousand pounds as a reward for my connivance in the plan respecting rosamond go on go on said mr torrens hastily that reward i have not received because the payments which sir henry had to make to you and other claims upon him had caused him to overdraw his bankers but yesterday morning he paid in eight thousand pounds and he intimated to one of the partners that he should give me a cheque for two thousand in the course of the afternoon the fact is continued mrs slingsby those bankers believe that i have property in india which sir henry courtenay's agent there manages for me and that the proceeds therefore pass through sir henry's hands this tale was invented to account for the numerous and large cheques which i have received from the baronet on that bank it was the saving clause for my reputation now those two thousand pounds which were promised me i can have for little trouble and a small risk indeed said mr torrens becoming more and more interested in this explanation yes continued mrs slingsby and i will tell you how almost immediately 
but I must first observe that I should have received the cheque last evening, had not the sudden flight of Rosamond interrupted the discourse which I was having with the baronet, and thrown us into confusion. But— and again she lowered her voice to an almost inaudible whisper. I can imitate the handwriting of Sir Henry Courtenay to such a nicety that it would defy detection. Now, do you understand me? I do, I do, answered Mr. Torrens. And you perceive that I have full confidence in you? asked the widow. Mr. Torrens rose and paced the room for a few minutes. He was deliberating within himself whether he should repose an equal trust in Mrs. Slingsby, and he decided upon doing so. She saw what was passing in his mind, and remained silent, confident as to the result. "'My dear madam,' he said, resuming his seat, "'I will at once admit to you that Sir Henry Courtenay is indeed no more.' The lady heard him with breathless attention, for though she was fully prepared for the avowal, yet when it came it sounded so awfully, so ominously, that she received it with emotions of terror and dismay. "'It is indeed too true,' continued Torrens, "'but think not for a moment that I am a murderer. No, no, bad as I may be, as I know myself to be, in fine, I could not perpetrate such a deed as that.' A strange and wonderful combination of circumstances led to the shocking catastrophe. Listen, and I will tell you all. Mr. Torrens then related every incident of the preceding evening, suppressing only that portion of the tale which involved the fact of his servant John Jeffreys being acquainted with the occurrence, and having lent his aid in disposing of the body. This circumstance he concealed through that inherent aversion which man ever has, to confess that he is in the power of any one, and he made it appear, by his own story, that, unassisted, he had buried the corpse. At first Mrs. Slingsby was incredulous relative to the version of the murder which she heard. She thought that Torrens was himself the perpetrator of the act, but when he declared how cruelly the robbery of his money had embarrassed him, and when she reflected that there really could have been no reason urgent or strong enough to induce him to make away with the baronet, she ended by fully believing his narrative. "'Then he is indeed no more,' she exclaimed. "'But, my God, what will be thought of his disappearance? And will not those inquiries, which I so much dread, be made?' "'As no suspicion can possibly fall upon either yourself or me,' responded Mr. Torrance, it is far from likely that any such inquiries will be instituted. No, you need not be alarmed on that head, my dear madam. I should rather be inclined to entertain apprehensions for the success of your own scheme of— The forgery, he added after a moment's pause. No danger can possibly attend that undertaking, said Mrs. Slingsby. The baronet stated at the banker's that he should give me the cheque yesterday— and it will be paid in a moment, even if they have already heard of his disappearance, which is scarcely probable, because the fears excited by that fact have not as yet become so strong as to lead to the suspicion that he has indeed met with foul play. "'You are, then, confident of being enabled to counterfeit his handwriting successfully?' asked Mr. Torrens. "'Beyond all possibility of doubt,' replied the widow. "'And shall you want my assistance?' inquired Torrens, thinking how he could start a pretext for claiming a portion of the expected proceeds of the nefarious plan. "'Listen to me,' said Mrs. Slingsby, after a few moments' deliberation, and now speaking as if she had finally come to a settled resolution on a particular point, which she had been revolving in her mind almost ever since Mr. Torrens entered the room. "'I have something to propose to you with regards us both,' and which may suit yourself as well as it would suit me. "'You are involved in embarrassments.' "'I am indeed,' replied Mr. Torrens, now awaiting in breathless suspense the coming explanation, which, by the leading question just put, appeared to relate to some scheme for relieving him of his difficulties. "'And these embarrassments are very serious,' continued the widow. "'So serious that they are insurmountable as far as I can see at present.' was the response. 
then you fear executions arrest prison and all the usual ordeal of an insolvent debtor asked the lady just so and sooner than enter on that ordeal i would commit suicide rejoined mr torrens the alternative i have to propose to you is not quite so serious nor alarming as that resumed mrs slingsby i have shown you that i can put myself in possession of two thousand pounds to-morrow morning will that sum relieve you completely from your difficulties and enable me to carry out those speculations which must produce a large fortune answered torrens then those two thousand pounds are at your disposal on one condition said mrs slingsby and that condition gasped mr torrens in mingled joy and suspense is that you marry me returned mrs slingsby as calmly as if she were making a bargain of a very ordinary nature marry you exclaimed her companion quite unprepared for this proposal yes marry me repeated the widow you want money to save you from ruin i want a husband to screen me from disgrace you are involved in pecuniary troubles i am in a way to become a mother i can save your person from a jail you can save my character from dishonour the arrangement is indeed an equitable one said mr torrens not without the least scintillation of satire in his remark but i see one fatal objection and that is your daughter rosamond observed mrs slingsby surely the whim the aversion or the fantasy of a girl will not induce you to reject a proposal which will save you from ruin and imprisonment and yet what could i say to her how could i explain my conduct what would she think after all she knows of you demanded mr torrens she has not the power to prevent the match and that is the principal point in the matter returned mrs slingsby coolly you may as well urge as an objection that clarence villiers my nephew is your son-in-law but i am not so foolish as to be alarmed at such scruples and you must have seen too much of the world to allow yourself to be irretrievably ruined for the sake of a few idle punctilios give me your decision at once ay or nay if it be the former the marriage may be celebrated by special license to-morrow evening if it be the latter there is at once an end of the business and we need not be the less good friends you regard the whole proposition then entirely as a matter of business said mr torrens well that is indeed the way to look at it of course if we strike a bargain and unite our fortunes we shall require only one establishment will you break up this in old burlington street and be contented to dwell at my cottage certainly was the reply the sale of my furniture will pay my debts and perhaps leave a surplus at all events we shall have the two thousand pounds clear and that sum you will place in my hands to-morrow morning said mr torrens interrogatively no to-morrow evening after the ceremony responded the widow then we cannot trust each other continued mr torrens i think we should act prudently and adopt as many mutual precautions as possible observed mrs slingsby coolly granted exclaimed mr torrens and what guarantee have i that when once the indissoluble knot shall have been tied you will hand me over the promised sum simply the fact that i do not wish to marry a man who will be the next morning conveyed away to a prison that is a mere assertion and no security remonstrated mr torrens we are talking the matter over in a purely business-like sense now as far as i can see the advantages will be all on your side if you happen to be in debt you will have a husband on whose person your creditors will pounce instead of on your own and at all events as you are with child you will have a person whom you can represent as the legitimate father of the expected offspring i will tell you how the business can be managed said mrs slingsby after a pause a thought has struck me i will lodge the money in the hands of a very respectable solicitor whom i know and you can accompany me to his office for the purpose in his keeping shall it remain with the understanding that it is to be paid to you on your becoming my husband 
good observed mr torrens who is the solicitor mr howard was the answer i know him and have no objection to him as the agent in this business i think we have now got over all obstacles in that respect a difficult task will it however prove to me to prepare my daughter this evening for the step which i am to take to-morrow oh i have no doubt you will succeed said mrs slingsby it would be indeed hard if a father could not overcome with his reasoning the objections of his own child i must do my best observed torrens rising at what hour to-morrow shall i call to accompany you to the lawyers at about twelve i shall go to the bank between ten and eleven and you can in the meantime obtain the marriage license it shall be done returned mr torrens the ceremony will be performed here he added interrogatively yes at seven o'clock in the evening i will make arrangements with two ladies whom i know to be bridesmaids and dr wagtail will give me away after the ceremony we will repair to torrens cottage thus calmly and deliberately was settled the solemn covenant between the man who had sold his daughter's virtue and the licentious woman who was now prepared to commit a forgery and the worthy pair separated mr torrens having embraced his intended wife because he considered a kiss to be as it were the seal of the bargain just concluded and also because mrs slingsby by her manner appeared to invite the salutation End of section 84section eighty five of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by deborah balm cambridge u k the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter eighty one rosamond at home we shall follow mr torrens homeward and see how he acquitted himself of the disagreeable and difficult task of breaking his matrimonial intentions to his daughter the fair but ruined rosamond it was past nine o'clock in the evening when he reached the cottage and rosamond with a charming filial solicitude to render her parents home as comfortable as possible had superintended the preparations for supper exercising a command to over the sad feelings which filled her bosom and invoking resignation with christian fortitude to her aid she even manifested a species of cheerfulness as she opened the front door at the sound of his well-known knock but alas it was not the innocent artless cheerfulness of other days it was merely the struggle of the moonbeam to pierce the mass of dark and menacing clouds and now behold the father and daughter seated at the supper-table that repast which the care of rosamond had endeavoured to render as agreeable as possible but which was disposed of hastily and without appetite on either side at length when the things were cleared away and mr torrens had fortified his courage with sundry glasses of wine he prepared to enter on the grave and important subject which occupied his mind rosamond my love he said speaking in as kind a tone as it was possible for his nature to assume i have something to communicate to you and shall be glad if you will hear me calmly and without excitement i have this evening seen mrs slingsby that woman exclaimed the daughter starting oh i had hoped that her name would no more be mentioned in this house i begged of you not to give way to excitement i warned you to be reasonable said mr torrens severely surely you can accord me your attention when i am anxious to discourse with you on matters of importance pardon me dearest father and oh do not blame nor reproach me if i manifest a very natural irritability a loathing an abhorrence she could say no more but burst into a flood of tears mr torrens suffered her to give full vent to her emotions for he knew that the reaction would produce comparative calmness rosamond he at length said 
you can be reasonable when you choose, and I do hope that you have sufficient confidence in your father to accord him your attention and to believe what he may state to you. Listen then, and rest assured that I should never take the part of any one against my own daughter. I have seen Mrs. Slingsby. Rosamond gave a convulsive start, but her father, appearing not to observe it, proceeded. It struck me, he continued, that she would never have had the presumption and impudence to call here this morning, if she were really as guilty as you supposed her to be. I therefore deemed it an act of justice to ascertain the nature of those explanations which she proffered in this room, and which your presence cut short. With that object in view, I proceeded to her abode, and she assured me that she was entirely innocent of any connivance in the atrocity perpetrated by Sir Henry Courtenay. Innocent! almost shrieked Rosamond. Oh, my dear father, you know not how specious, how plausible that woman can be when she chooses, and it has suited her purpose to be so with you, but be not deceived. Do you imagine that I am not old enough and sufficiently experienced to discriminate between sincerity and duplicity? demanded Mr. Torrens. I tell you, Rosamond, that you wrong Mrs. Slingsby, that your suspicions are most injurious. Reflect, consider before you thus condemn. You overheard a few words which immediately threw you into a state of such excitement that your imagination tortured all the subsequent discourse into an evidence of guilt on the part of a lady who is deeply attached to you, who loves you as if she were your own mother, and who will die of grief if you continue thus to misjudge her. Yes, Rosamond, Mrs. Slingsby has declared that she will put a period to her existence if you persist in your present belief. She accuses you of ingratitude towards her, after all her affectionate kindness in your behalf, and, should she carry her dreadful threat into execution, which I much fear, for she seems literally distracted, her blood will be upon your head. Merciful heavens! exclaimed Rosamond, appalled by this terrible announcement. But if I cannot command my own convictions, she added hastily, you must cherish a Christian spirit, you must be less prompt in forming opinions, less ready to arrive at those convictions which you represent to be uncontrollable, said Mr. Torrens, endeavouring to bewilder his daughter, and thereby render her spirit ductile and her mind pliant, so that he might manage both as he pleased. So far, from nourishing malignity against Mrs. Slingsby, you should seek consolation with her, for your own mother is not here to console you. God be thanked that my mother is not here to witness my disgrace, ejaculated Rosamond, clasping her hands fervently. For the sake of my daughters, I was wrong, yes, I was wrong, not to have married again, said Mr. Torrens, as if musing to himself. I should have given a protectress to my children, a lady who would have been a second mother to them and then all this would not have occurred. But it is not yet too late to ensure your future welfare, Rosamond, by those means, he added, turning towards his daughter, who had listened with surprise to her father's previous observations, and in accomplishing that aim I may at the same time afford a convincing proof to a deserving, wrongly suspected, and misjudged woman of my own esteem, and inferentially of your regret at the calumniatory sentiments you have cherished concerning her. My dear father, I do not understand you, cried Rosamond, a dreadful suspicion weighing on her mind, and which nevertheless seemed so wild and ridiculous, so utterly impossible to be well founded, that she fancied she had not rightly comprehended the sentiments of her parent. I am thinking how I can best ensure your welfare and happiness, Rosamond, he said, by giving you a substitute for that maternal protectress whom you have lost, 
one who will be a companion and a friend to you father exclaimed rosamond horrified at the idea of having a stepmother and trembling with indescribable alarms lest she had indeed too well read her sire's intentions respecting the one whom he proposed to invest with that authority will you hear me with calmness will you subdue this excitement which amounts to an undutiful aversion to all i am projecting for your sake demanded mr torrens again assuming a severe tone and then perceiving that his daughter was dismayed by his manner he hastily added as if determined at once to put an end to the painful scene if i have consulted you rosamond on the step that i propose to take it was because i deemed you sensible and reasonable enough to merit that proof of confidence on my part and obedient enough to submit becomingly to the dictates of my superior wisdom and experience know then that it is my intention to marry again for your sake and that my inclinations as well as my interests induce me to fix my choice upon mrs slingsby rosamond uttered not a word but fell back senseless in her chair obstinate fool muttered torrens between his teeth as he hastened forward to save her from slipping off on the fender but i will neither argue nor consult any more i will command where i wish to be obeyed he applied a scent bottle to her nostrils and she soon gave signs of returning animation opening her eyes she glanced wildly at her father as if to interrogate him whether that were really true which appeared to have been haunting her like a horrid dream father father she murmured grasping his hands you will not no you will not do what you have said oh i implore you i conjure sacrifice not your own happiness and mine at the same instant i was not mistaken in one syllable that i overheard between that woman and that man and their discourse filled me with horror she is his paramour father she is in a way to become a mother silence daughter cried mr torrens sternly and now listen to me while i make you acquainted with my commands not only is it my intention to marry mrs slingsby but i desire that you will treat her with respect if not with affection and as you value my love and the continuance of my kindness you will observe these instructions if anything more be wanting to induce you to comply with my desire that additional argument will perhaps be found in the fact that if i do not marry mrs slingsby i shall be ruined utterly undone my property wrested from me my person conveyed to a prison and you thrust out houseless and penniless into the wide world without a soul to protect or befriend you now i have told you all and it is for you to decide whether your prejudices shall prevail against my most substantial interests rosamond was astounded at the words which met her ears and she knew not how to reply for a few moments she stood gazing vacantly upon her father's countenance as if to read thereon a confirmation of words the import of which seemed too terrible to be true then probably experiencing the necessity of seeking the solitude of her own chamber for the purpose of giving vent to the overflowing fullness of her heart's emotions she hurried from the room poor friendless girl dreadful was the position in which she found herself placed oh why were not clarence and adelais near to console her to receive her beneath their protecting influence alas she would not have dared to face them even were they in the metropolis at the time for she could not have revealed to them her dishonour oh no she would sooner have died throwing herself on a seat in the privacy of her bedchamber she burst into tears and gave vent to her anguish in heart-rending sobs an hour passed and still she thought not of retiring to rest she was in a state of utter despair she heard her father ascend to his chamber 
but this circumstance reminded her not that the usual hour when she herself sought her couch had gone by suddenly she was aroused from the deep reverie of woe that had succeeded the violent outburst of her anguish by the movement of the handle of the door as if some one were about to enter her room she started and listened the bed being between the place where she was and the door so that she could not see the latter yes some one was indeed entering the chamber with a faint scream she darted forward and beheld a man in the act of closing the door behind him the intruder was jeffreys the recently hired servant what has brought you hither john inquired rosamond in hasty and anxious tone for she feared lest something had happened to her father nothing but your own beautiful self miss answered the ruffian advancing towards her as well as he was able for he was much intoxicated begone cried rosamond her whole countenance becoming suddenly crimson with indignation begone i say and to-morrow my father will know how to punish this insolence your father miss won't do no such thing returned jeffreys and it'll be all the worse for you if you holler i know a many things that wouldn't render it safe for master to quarrel with me so give me a kiss villain exclaimed rosamond bursting into tears how dare you thus insult me leave the room or i alarm the house at any risk and she rushed towards the bell pull none of that nonsense miss or i'll hang your father as sure as you're alive said jeffreys placing his back to the door folding his arms and surveying rosamond with the insolence of a licentious drunken bully hang my father repeated the unhappy girl staggering back and sinking into a chair for so many dreadful things had recently occurred that her mind was no more attuned to give immediate credence to evil than to receive good tidings yes by jingo said jeffreys i can hang him any day i like but what's more i know pretty well all that's happened to you i didn't listen for nothing at the parlour door this morning when that mrs bingsby or stingsby or whatever her name is was here my god my god murmured rosamond pressing her hands to her brow with all her might for she felt as if she were going mad now don't take on so miss said jeffreys i'm sure i didn't mean to vex you like that but the fact is i've took a great fancy to you and if so be i let out that your father did draw a knife across the throat of that baronet which come here last night and which i suppose was the same you spoke of this morning to mrs bingsby monster shrieked rosamond in a shrill penetrating tone for she was unable any longer to subdue the horrible emotions which racked and tortured her goading her almost to madness in another instant mr torrens was heard to rush from his chamber a moment more and he forced his way into his daughter's room hurling the villain jeffreys forward with the violence exerted in dashing open the door father dear father exclaimed rosamond springing into his arms save me save me from that monster who has told me such dreadful dreadful things be calm rosamond said mr torrens in a low and hoarse tone or you will alarm the other servant jeffreys he added turning towards the fellow who was swaying himself backwards and forwards in the middle of the room in that vain attempt to appear sober so often made by drunken men how dare you to intrude here but follow me i must speak to you alone father one word said rosamond in a voice indicative of deep feeling this man uttered a frightful accusation against you oh an accusation so terrible that my blood curdles nonsense rosamond interrupted mr torrens cruelly agitated you see that he has taken a drop too much he is a good well-meaning fellow and will be very sorry in the morning sorry why the devil should i be sorry cried jeffreys with the dogged insolence of inebriation i don't know what i've got to be sorry for come come said mr torrens gently pushing his daughter aside and approaching the man-servant in a coaching conciliatory way this is carrying the thing too far john well well we can talk it over in the morning miss and i dare say we shall make matters right enough together 
stammered the drunken hind, as he allowed himself to be led away from the chamber by Mr. Torrance. You are a pretty gal, and if I said anything amiss... The almost maddened father hurried him over the threshold, and Rosamond hastened to secure the door behind them both. Then, flinging herself into a chair, she exclaimed, "'My God! What horrors have met my ears this night! Misfortunes, crimes, woes, fears, outrages have entered the house like an army carrying desolation along with it. But my father, a murderer? Oh, heavens, no, no, it cannot be! And yet that dread accusation, so cool, so systematic! My God! My God!' and she wept as if her heart would break from this painful or rather most agonizing condition of mind she was aroused by a low knock at her door and in answer to her question who was there the voice of her father replied she hastened to admit him but as he entered she started back appalled by the ghastliness of his countenance every lineament of which denoted horror and fearful emotions father tell me all keep me not in suspense let me know the worst exclaimed rosamond clasping her hands in an imploring manner dreadful things have happened i am sure and my brain is reeling maddening daughter said mr torrens taking her hand you must and you shall know the worst now for i find that the miscreant jeffreys has indeed told you too much for me to attempt to conceal the truth just heavens my father stained with blood the blood of vengeance on account of his dishonoured daughter said rosamond speaking in broken sentences and with hysterical excitement while her eyes were fixed intently and with a fearfully wild expression upon the haggard countenance of her sire no not so rosamond answered mr torrens emphatically sit down there and try and compose yourself for a few moments while i give you an explanation which circumstances have rendered imperative the wretched girl suffered herself to be placed on a seat her father then drew another chair close to the one which she occupied and leaning with folded arms over the back of it he continued in these terms last night after you had retired to your room sir henry courtenay called yes he dared to visit the house into which such dishonour and so much misery had been brought by his means but he came to offer every possible atonement which it was in his power to make and then i ascended to your room here to make you aware of his presence in the parlour below and of the proposals which i had received but i found you in a state of mind too profoundly excited to bear the announcement i remained with you to console and tranquillize you and when I saw that you were growing more calm, I retraced my way downstairs. Merciful heavens, what a spectacle then met my eyes! And Mr. Torrens, having introduced his fearful history by this deceptive and well-coloured preface, proceeded to narrate the facts of the murder precisely, as they had really occurred, not forgetting to mention the robbery of a sum of money which he had left on the table. He then explained the part which John Jeffreys had subsequently performed in the occurrences of the preceding night, and he wound up in the following manner. Thus you perceive, dear Rosamond, how a fearful combination of circumstances would fix dark and dreadful suspicions on me, were this tragedy to be brought to light. And now, too, you can understand how that miscreant Jeffreys dared to presume upon his knowledge of the shocking event, how believing me to be completely in his power he fancied that i dared not defend my own daughter from his licentious ruffianism and more than all this rosamond mrs slingsby holds me also beneath the rod of terrorism for she knew that the baronet came hither last night she knew also that he did not return and i was compelled to reveal to her the whole truth even as circumstances have now forced me to reveal it to you and this is the secret of my intended marriage with her a marriage that will take place to-morrow and into which she has coerced me thus rosamond if you ever loved and if you still love your unhappy father pity him pity him but do not reproach him 
nor aggravate his grief and his mental anguish by thought or deed on your part so ingeniously had mr torrens blended truth and fiction into his narrative to work upon the feelings of his daughter so artfully had he combined and explained the various incidents in order to represent himself as the victim of cruel circumstances that the generous-minded rosamond felt the deepest commiseration and sympathy on behalf of her father rapidly taking possession of her soul my dearest parent she said i crave your pardon i implore your forgiveness for having wronged you by the most unjust the most horrible suspicions but the conduct of that man jeffreys his awful accusation the reluctance you appeared to exhibit in dealing summarily with him when you entered the room the first time this night all these things operated powerfully upon my mind which has been attenuated by so many dreadful shocks within the last ten or twelve days alas what sorrows have overtaken us what perils environ us let us fly from this neighbourhood dear father let us leave england it is impossible rosamond interrupted mr torrens hastily i had myself thought of that means of ensuring personal safety but i abandoned the idea almost as soon as formed for it was better to stay here surrounded by danger yet having bread to eat than seek a foreign clime to starve we can work dear father we can toil for our livelihood but no never should you be reduced to such a painful necessity so long as your daughter has health and strength to labour for our mutual support exclaimed the excellent-hearted girl oh let us fly let us quit this country let us repair to france i have some few accomplishments drawing music a knowledge of all the branches of needlework and it will be hard indeed if i cannot earn enough to procure us bread no no rosamond it cannot be said mr torrens tears now trickling down his cheeks for the better he became acquainted with the admirable traits of his daughter's character traits which adversity misfortune and danger now developed the more bitterly did his heart smite him for the awful treachery he had perpetrated with regard to her and wherefore is it impossible she asked consider my dear father by what circumstances you are now surrounded on one side is jeffreys whom you dare not offend whom you cannot discharge and from whose ruffianism your daughter is not safe on the other side is this marriage with mrs slingsby a marriage which i now perceive to be forced upon you a marriage that will bring into this house a person whom neither of us can ever love or respect enough enough rosamond exclaimed mr torrens all these sad things these dangers and these sacrifices have become interwoven with the destiny which it is mine to fulfil and i must pursue my painful course follow on my sad career in the best manner that i may i cannot risk starvation in a foreign land i could not support an existence maintained by the toils of my daughter besides i am confident of being able to realise a fortune by my speculations in this neighbourhood here then must i remain and now rosamond it remains for you to decide whether you will receive the mother-in-law whose imperious circumstances force upon you or whether you will abandon your father never never will i leave you cried the affectionate girl throwing her arms around her parent's neck and embracing him tenderly the interview the painful interview between the father and his child then terminated the former retired to his own apartment a prey to feelings of the most harrowing nature and the latter sought her couch to which slumber was brought through sheer exhaustion but the horrors of the early portion of the night were perpetuated in her dreams end of section eighty five section eighty six of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter eighty two the forged check oh what a strange and at the same time what a wondrous world is this in which we live and how marvellous is human progress 
the utmost attainments effected by the wisdom of our ancestors were but ignorance and short-sightedness compared with the knowledge of the present day antiquity had its grand intellects and its sublime geniuses but it furnished not the same abundance of materials to act upon as is afforded by the discoveries and likewise by the spirit of this age but are we proportionately happier on this account than were our forefathers is the working man for instance more prosperous more comfortable more enviable as to his condition than the aboriginal briton who lived in a cave or the hollow of a tree and who painted his body to protect it against the cold with all our prosperity with all the grandeur the glitter and the refinement of our civilization with all our moralizing institutions and our love of social order and mental improvement we yet find the national heart devoured tortured and preyed upon by that undying serpent pauperism yes the millions are not so happy so prosperous or so comfortable as they ought to be for they are compelled to gnaw the terrors of civilization's field while the proud and heartless oligarchy self-appoint the corn proud and heartless indeed are the rulers and the mighty ones of this land and if the millions remain passive and patient that pride and that heartlessness will grow the one more despotic and the other more selfish it was but a few days ago that we marked two distinct articles in the morning newspapers which formed a contrast fearfully significant in its evidence of the pride and the heartlessness which we abominate on the one hand and of the distress and suffering which we so deeply deplore on the other one of these articles consisted of but four lines the other occupied nearly two columns the first stated as laconically as possible that bread had risen to thirteen pence the quartern loaf and recorded a rapidly disposed of regret that provisions should be so dear on account of the poor the second gave a labored fulsome and tedious wire-drawn narrative of her majesty's state ball thus the misery endured by millions in consequence of dearness and scarcity is a trivial matter deserving only of four lines whereas the trumpery nonsense and childish tomfoolery of a royal dance are deemed of sufficient importance to merit nearly two columns oh instead of giving balls and splendid entertainments at such a time if the sovereign of this land were to say to the people ye are starving and it makes my heart bleed to think that from your very vitals are wrung the hundreds of thousands of pounds which are wasted by myself and the other members of the royal family on our frivolities our whims our caprices and our wanton extravagances therefore will i give you back one half of the enormous income which i have hitherto enjoyed in the full confidence that my example will be imitated by many others who prey upon you did the sovereign thus speak to the nation the nation would be justly proud of its sovereign and yet this sovereign would only be performing a duty dictated by humanity and common justice what would be thought of the father of a family who feasted on turtle and venison accompanied by generous wines every day while his children were thrust into the cold humid cellar to devour a mouldy crust and drink water yet the sovereign delights in the attribute of a general and comprehensive paternal solicitude in the welfare of the people but it is an attribute which exists only in the imaginations of grovelling courtiers or lickspittle historians royalty and aristocracy are intensely necessarily and thoroughly selfish and as for any anxiety on behalf of the toiling and suffering millions the idea is absurd the notion is a mere delusion the assertion that such a feeling exists is a lie a monstrous wicked atrocious lie there is more of the milk of human kindness in a single cottage than in all the palaces of europe taking together there is more true philanthropy in one poor man's hovel than in a thousand mansions of the great and wealthy in the fashionable quarters of london oh if the father or the mother can dance and be glad while the children are famishing the sooner all ties are severed between such worthless parents and such an oppressed and outraged offspring the better nero danced and sang on the summit of a tower at the spectacle presented to his eyes by burning rome and festivity and rejoicing reign in our english palaces at a moment when scarcity menaces the land with famine and its invariable attendant pestilence people of england ye now understand how much sympathy ye may expect on the part of those who derive all their wealth from the sweat of your brow people of ireland ye now comprehend how much pity your starving condition excites on the part of your rulers people of scotland ye now perceive how worthy the great ones of the realm are of your adulation 
but it is sickening as it is sorrowful to dwell on this subject. Some of our readers may perhaps ask us wherefore we broach it at all. We will reply by means of a few questions. Is not every individual member of a society interested in the welfare of that society? Or ought he not at least to be so? Is he not justified in denouncing the errors or the downright turpitude of the magistrates whom that society has chosen to govern it, and who derive their power only from its good will and pleasure? Or is it not indeed his duty to proclaim those errors and that turpitude? Should not this duty be performed, even if it be unpleasant, and can we ever hope to ameliorate our condition, unless we expose the abuses which oppress, degrade, and demoralize us? Oh! let no one rashly and in a random manner say that he cares nothing about politics. Such an assertion denotes a willful disregard not only of his neighbor's interests, but also of his own. Were all men to entertain such an indifference, the people would be the veriest slaves that an unrestrained despotism and an unwatched tyranny could render them. It is as necessary for the industrious classes to protect their rights and privileges by zealously guarding them, as to adopt precautions to save their houses from fire. One word more. It is a common saying, and as absurd as it is common. Oh, women have no right to meddle in politics. Women, on the contrary, have as much right as the lords of the creation to exhibit an interest in the systems and institutions by which they are governed. For the sake of their children, as well as for their own, they should assert and exercise that right. It is a lamentable delusion to suppose that the intellect of women is not powerful, nor comprehensive enough to embrace such consideration. The intellect of women is naturally as strong as that of man, but it has less chances and less opportunities of developing its capacity. The masculine study of politics would aid the intellect of woman in putting forth its strength, and we hope that the day is gone by when the female sex are to be limited to the occupations of the drawing-room, the nursery, or the kitchen. We do not wish to see women become soldiers or sailors, nor to work at severe employment, but we are anxious to behold them thinkers as well as readers, utilitarians as well as domestic economists. And we know of no greater benefit that could be conferred on society in general than that which might be derived from the influence of the well-developed intellect of woman. Her sight is naturally better poised than that of man, far-seeing and quick-sighted is she, a readiness at devising and combining plans to meet emergencies is intuitive with her. Her judgment is correct, her taste good, and she profits by experience far more usefully than does man. Is it not absurd, then, is it not unjust, and is it not unwise to deny to woman the right of exercising her proper influence in that society of which she is the ornament and the delight? Alas, that there should be such exceptions to the general rule of female excellence as Martha Slingsby, a woman whose principles were thoroughly corrupt, whose licentious passions were of the most devouring, insatiable kind, and whose talent for wicked combinations and evil plottings was unfortunately so great. Let us return to this hypocritical and abandoned creature, and follow her in the vile scheme which now occupies all her attention. Having breakfasted at an early hour, she seated herself at her desk when she drew forth a packet of letters received by her at various times from Sir Henry Courtenay, and the signatures of which now became the objects of her special study. The art of counterfeiting the late baronet's autograph was practiced by her for nearly half an hour, for though she was already tolerably confident of her ability to forge his signature most successfully, as she had assured Mr. Torrens, she nevertheless deemed it prudent to render the imitation as perfect as possible. At last the atrocious deed was accomplished to her complete satisfaction, and a cheque for two thousand pounds lay drawn in a thoroughly business-like manner upon her desk. She was bold and courageous in the execution of plots and the carrying out of deep schemes, but this dark and dangerous crime which she had perpetrated caused her to shudder from head to foot. Hitherto all her wickedness had been of a nature calculated only, if detected, to involve her in disgrace and not in peril, to ruin her character but not place her life in jeopardy. Now she had taken a step, a bold and desperate step, which at once set her on the high road that conducts all those who are found treading its pathway, to the foot of the scaffold. Yes, she shrank back and she trembled violently as she rose from the desk whereon the forged check now lay and for a moment she was inclined to seize it, to rend it into a thousand pieces, 
and thus to dispel at once and in an instant the tremendous black cloud of stormy danger which she had drawn over her own head. But no. She had courage enough to be wicked and rash, but she had not strength of mind sufficient to render her prudent. She therefore decided on daring all, risking everything by the presentation of the forged check. Having dressed herself in a style of unusual elegance, she proceeded in a hackney coach to Lombard Street and alighted at the door of the banking house on which the check was drawn. Saying to herself, Now for the aid of all my courage, she entered the spacious establishment and advanced towards the counter. One of the numerous clerks in attendance instantly received the check which she handed across to him, and as it left her hand a chill struck to her heart, and she would at the moment have given worlds to recall it. Her composure was now only the effect of utter desperation, but so unruffled was her countenance that not a lineament was so changed as to be calculated to engender suspicion. The clerk took the check to the nearest desk upon the counter, and after reading it with more than usual attention, as Mrs. Slingsby thought, he said, This is dated the day before yesterday, madam. Have you 